Hey, Corey, this is a quote that I saw in a newspaper article. What's that? That was not related at all to agriculture. This came out of the Wall Street Journal. Wow. Yeah. If shiny new grain, grain bins seem to be growing like corn in July on local farms, your eyes are not deceiving you. That was the headline. Wall Street Journal is writing about grain bins. What Numerous if they just drove through the, where the derechos were? <laughs> they, might, <laughs> they might have. Numerous reasons exist for farming operations to add storage to their holdings. So even the Wall Street Journal thinks grain storage is important. The rest of the article, I will tell you, was not worth it. So that's why we're here putting an episode together to get the facts straight as to why farmers are building grain storage. What did the rest of the article say? Uh, it was evading taxes. They oh. were trying to get it, inheritance reduced tax when it comes to Basically, the whole thing was about tax, whether it was writing okay. things off Section 179, estate tax, trying to defer income. It just, the whole article was slanted that way. But okay. the headline was still important. Really? Okay. Because that's what formed the basis of our conversation today. We have a guest that we got to meet just a couple of days ago. And Bree's been hanging out with us the entire National Farm Machinery Show, just kind of hanging around, making sure we're going to treat her right on the last day. And she's another one of the, I would say, experts that Sukup has brought in yes. to partner with. <laughs> you don't work for Sukup, but you're here. We don't work for Sukup, but we're here, right? Yeah. So Absolutely. Why don't you tell the listeners who you are and what you do? Yeah, so my name is Bree Beals. I am a regional sales officer for AgriFinancial Services. Um, so we're a national lender uh, for farms and ranches. Um, we offer loans, leases, and lines of credit. Um, my specialty, or where I kind of spend the, the bulk of my time, is in grain storage um, and helping farmers uh, you know, build up that space so that they can be more profitable in their production. So you play in the same realm as Farm Credit and we the sure Rabos uh-huh. and yep, John Deere absolutely. Financial and that kind of stuff. Yep, sure do. Yeah, we do um, the equipment side like John Deere does. Um, on the on the Farm Credit side, we do the same, you know, real estate loans and lines of credit and things like that. So yeah, so we all kind of play in the same sandbox, if you will. Right. So what sets you apart? Yeah, well, I always say service, yeah. right? So <laughs> our, um, our main goal is that when we're working with a customer, we're on farm with that customer. Um, for one, we all enjoy that space. Um, everybody on our team uh, has an agricultural background, and so we kind of thrive in that space. So uh, when we're doing business with a customer, we're going to go out to that farm. We're going to sit down at their kitchen table or, or in their shop, or sometimes we're riding in the cab of a tractor or a combine. Um, but we're doing business alongside them um, and really we pride ourselves in understanding um, their production um, and really what, what their needs are. Um, I can, I can bring you a a box of solutions, but it may not fit your, your need. And so, um, so we really try to ingrain ourselves in what they're doing um, and then find a solution that, that fits that exact producer. Their financing solutions are ingrained. Safety is ingrained in Suka. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sounds like she might be playing in your sandbox a little bit. There. <laughs> Just a little bit, but I can play nice because I think the information she's going to share today is going to be way more valuable than anything else to our listeners. So as people have come up to you at this show, mm-hmm. what's the question you get asked the most? What are people asking you about? Uh, the, the main question I get is interest rate. What's the interest rate? Um, that's the hot topic in the... In the space right now is just, you know, rates are higher than, than what uh, we've had. Um, we were really, really spoiled with really great rates for a long time. If you look back, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago, rates were much higher and you compare that to rates today and they're not that bad. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a year ago, 18 months ago, 24 months ago, we were in some really amazing rate environment and, and right now they're a little bit higher. But, um, you know, what we try to look at is really where the ROI comes in, and, and on-farm storage gives us a really good look at that. Um, it's one thing that I can equate an ROI to on-farm um, versus something like a shop or, um, you know, a tractor or something like that. Those are a little bit harder to pinpoint. Um, but, you know, when you're talking interest rate, and you've got some tax advantages there with the leasing options that we offer. It really offsets that higher rate environment, and so um, you can really get past that um, that objection of rate being higher than it mm-hmm. used to be. And so um, once guys get comfortable with, you know, here's kind of where your ROI is, here's why it makes sense, here's your tax advantage, you know, then the rate the rate portion kind of falls away. But, um, but yeah, rate, rates are a little bit higher, and that seems to be the, the hot topic around here. So part of the Wall Street Journal article was correct. There is a tax advantage. 
to building grain storage, but we're going to get into that yeah. a little bit later. I sure. like that you already talked about the return on investment. Mm -hmm. Farm for Profit podcast, we're here to talk about the profitability of grain storage. Right. So what is an advantage? What are some of the advantages to farmers to build grain storage? Sure, yeah. So, you know, the largest advantage I always tell guys when you're when you're farming and and taking it to the co-op, your your market to to sell that grain is, is fairly small. It's like kind of like a focus group of one, right? Yeah. You've got your grain marketer here and, and they're using just specific markets that they're selling to. When you can hold your own grain on farm and then sell that at a time that makes more sense, obviously not at harvest because that generally doesn't make sense. Um, but it also opens you up to additional markets. Um, I have some guys that are in Kansas that are selling grain down in Oklahoma and making, uh, you know, 40 cents more a bushel than they would have made, you know, right there in their, at their hometown co-op. And so, um, so that's the largest, um, the, the reason that, that most of the guys are doing that. But, and then also you're able to, um, to kind of control the quality of your grain a little mm -hmm. bit more, um, add moisture, dry it down, whatever it needs to be done um, to make that, that grain more, mm -hmm. more palatable for the market, they're able to do that and have a little more hands-on involvement in doing so. Our buddy Snark at GFY.ag would also tell you, you know, if you have the grain, you have the power. Yes, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You're really controlling your future, right? And, and really... Uh, controlling your paycheck if you can really play the market well. Um, and we always partner our, our, our farmers with a grain marketer that can help them in that space. Um, probably one of the main um, concerns that I get from, from farmers that are new to on-farm storage, that are just looking at putting up their first storage bins, um, is, okay, now, I, now it's on me to market it. And, and what if I'm busy and I don't you know, pay attention to the indicators in the market when yeah. it's time to sell? Um, we try to make sure that we're, we're lining them up with our partners at, at um, Consolidated Grain and Barge um, to give them a grain marketer that can help them play that market mm -hmm. and open up additional markets for them. So is your financing products only for grain bins or do you also finance flat storage or condo storage at an elevator? Yeah, we'll finance any, any type okay. of storage there. So um, any type of fixture that would be commercial and, um, and you know, regular producer storage. Um, we'll finance any rolling equipment, implements, mm -hmm. um, irrigation systems. If it has to do with farming or ranching, we can, we right, can yeah. lend on it. So I would say the, the last couple of years has been anomalies for m at harvest. Grain prices have actually been pretty good. Yes. And basis has actually been pretty good. Right. So someone could almost make the argument that why would I, why would I need to store it when I could just take it? But historically, right, right. there's yeah. carry. Yes. And better basis is to be had in the market. Right, yeah. So I always tell guys, look at a five-year average. That's going to give you a, a little better indication of um, where the market's been and then maybe where it's headed. So then we can kind of look at some trends as to, uh, yeah, the last couple of years have been have been really great for selling uh, at harvest. And, and there hasn't been a lot of reason to hold grain. Um, but... Um, if you look at a five-year, even a seven-year average, that really tells the story of where the market's been and then and maybe yeah. where it's headed. So um, those trends definitely change. You know, yeah. guys are, are never get comfortable in one space because yeah. as soon as you do, it's going to change. And so, um, so yeah, we have a lot of those conversations. And then I would, I would say as a farmer, something that's hard to put a value on, your, your time. Your time. Mm -hmm. At harvest, if you have to go sit and wait in line at the elevator, because yes. so many people have to go to the elevator at harvest, they don't have enough storage. Right. Um, you know, you'd be harvesting into January, mm -hmm. you know, and then yeah. you're at the will of the weather. So right. being able to go back and store it on farm and haul it when you have time. Yes. Yeah. That, that control sense. factor is such a, a big piece to having on farm storage and, and being able to, to harvest when you need to, store when you need to, sell when you need to, and then save that time at, at harvest of sitting in, in a line. And right now, I mean, obviously, I think this is across the board. Um, producers are having trouble finding truck drivers um, mm -hmm. that will that will come and haul that grain. And so um, now you've got another layer of complexity on top of, of harvest itself um, to find the help to move the grain for you. And then you're paying them to, to sit in line at, a, at an elevator for what could be hours, you know, yeah, right. at, at least in our part of the country during wheat harvest, you could sit there for hours. So, yeah. So we've had the show here has really demonstrated and reminded us that we have listeners of all different levels and skill and experience sure. to the podcast. So Corey, when you, oh, right. So when you talk to basis, can you explain a little bit more to the listeners what drives basis and what that means? So the way Snark would, would tell me on a Twitter spaces is basis is local demand, mm -hmm. right? So 
whether you're cattle feed producer, ethanol plant, hog feed, um, if you need that grain, they will pay you more. So basis is uh, either negative or positive to sh the Chicago board. So it might be 15 under. If it was $7, then it would be 685 If it was 15 over, it would be 715 mm -hmm. <clears throat> So in our area, typically the ethanol plants are pushing the basis. If you go to your local co-op, it's not that, that good. Right. So then diving a little bit deeper into a comment that you mentioned early on, Bree, for our listeners that need need a little bit more context or maybe aren't necessarily corn and soybean farmers themselves, you talked about how the ability to dry or maintain moisture affects its palatability for the market, its marketability. Why, why is that important in grain? Right. Yeah. So you figure, and I have some guys just recently that added some dryers to their storage. Um, and the main reason was they, have, they had a lot of acres of corn to cut. And if they could start a little earlier and dry it down and then store it, now they're saving time, right? Um, and, and also the weather factor comes into play there. If it's a little wet and they can dry it down, um, then they can go ahead and get it out of the field and they don't run the risk of losing it due to, you know, some major weather catastrophe that rolls through. So, um, so that has been, that has been highly important for those guys. As far as the moisture goes, you know, if they're adding moisture to beans, that's adding to weight, um, that's giving them more bushels, that's, that's more profitability mm -hmm. for them. Um, I have one particular farmer down in Winfield, Kansas, um, who's mentioned multiple times that, you know, just being able to add moisture to his beans and, and to control the moisture in the, in the bin has been highly profitable for him. So those things that you maybe wouldn't, are, are, wouldn't at all be able to control in a co-op environment, um, they can really control on farm. And, and then I, I also think it gives them a little sense of pride of, I grew it and then I also conditioned it and now I'm selling it at a higher market price than I would have if I had just taken it to my, to my local co-op. So more hands-on for them. That's an, uh, another thing that you can actually draw ROI on mm -hmm. right to the bottom line in year one with, with drying. Yep. Um, if you take it to the local co-op, they will dry it for you. Right. But they have, it's like four, five, six cents per bushel per point of moisture. Uh -huh. Yep. And then they also have shrink. Yes. And FM and all that. And they'll ding you everywhere they can. That's right. where they make money. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so just at four cents per bushel per point, take five points of moisture out of it. Mm -hmm. A 250,000 bushel farm. Right. Would be about $50,000. Mm -hmm. We can dry on the farm for a penny to a penny and a half per point. Right. You'd save over like thirty. Two thousand dollars per mm -hmm. acre, just in that, yeah, and not have any of the discounts, and then you can go to the ethanol plant and not have shrink, right, right, and you don't have to dry down to fifteen percent or fourteen percent where the local co-op would want to dry it down to. You can go right. to fifteen and a half, yes. maybe sixteen, sixteen, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it definitely leaves you more options um, on that side of things, and and we do when we look at ROI. Um, we're also accounting for those things like the cost to run the electricity for the dryer. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I even give the, the producer a kickback for the time that they're spending to dry it, right, and, and to store it and to manage it. And so um, we really try to drill down on an ROI that, that matches their, their current production and, and give them a really good idea of, of what it would look like. So you mentioned FM. Mm -hmm. So there's more than just moisture yeah. when we deliver our grain, which is another thing we've learned here at the Sukup booth is – there's some bonus points to having the proper handling equipment set up so you're not damaging the grain when it's going in and out also. Yeah, you got damage, uh, FM. They'll, they'll, every co-op will grade it or should be grading it. That's why they're probing your truck and mm -hmm. all that. And believe me, they want that kind of stuff because they are the ultimate. They will blend that out. They will ding you for 25 cents a bushel or whatever and then blend it out and sell it as number two yellow corn and make mm -hmm. that 25 cents back. Mm -hmm. Yep. Another item, Bree, that we kind of hit at right away when you were describing uh, how and why you like financing this type of a project for a farmer was the marketability, the flexibility that the farmer has to make sales. Can you expand a little bit more upon how and why that's important? Yeah. So, um, so the biggest plus side to that is that, you know, if guys are using their local co-op, and this is not to, to, to bash local co-ops oh, by no, any means. They, yep. <laughs> they, they, they definitely serve a purpose and guys have been using them for years and, 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 it, and it works. Um, but there's, it's kind of one of those better way to do things, right? There's, there's a, there's a better, a better way to make more money out there. To so farm for profit. To farm for profit. Exactly. Yes. And so, um, so I always, I always tell guys, you know, if you're looking at the difference between um, what you're 
what you're paying at your co-op and then what you're selling it for there versus the cost to store it on farm mm -hmm. and then the um, the plus side of what you can make on on basis or carry at, the, at that time if there's carry in the market. It just, it, it's a no brainer because there's so much more money to be made on the side of storing it yourself that um, you can't, you can't argue with that, right? right? There's there's more money out there to capture, and, and, and you that's can what still sell it to a co-op. Yeah, you absolutely <coughs> still can sell it to the co-op. Yeah. yeah, just having more control gives you more right. marketing options. Absolutely, and, and you're not paying the storage at the elevator. Exactly, because that's another option: deliver it and pay storage because mm -hmm. it didn't want to sell it yet. Yep. Yeah, and that is why if you build a grain setup yourself, mm -hmm. you have fixed costs of your own. Right. It's not going to be free, right, Corey? Right. No, no, no. It's it's not going to be free. It's going to cost you at every step of the game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but so will storage. storing. What's that? So yeah. will storing uptown at the elevator. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. You will get pay. You will get charged way more at the elevator than you will building your own. You know, over years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at some point, your bins are going to pay off, right? You're going to pay off that lease, and now, now whatever you're, now you're making more of a profit. They've right. paid for themselves, and and you're not paying the five cents a, a it's five cents in my area a bushel yeah. uh, to store at the co-op, um, and it might cost you on average, we guess about a, a cent and a half to store it yourself with electricity and and your time involvement right. in in managing the grain. And so, right there, you've got three and a half cents on yeah. the plus. Yeah, because Steve yesterday said. The two million bushel bin customer paid for that in one year. One year, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. now it's just ongoing maintenance cost. Right. That completely shrinks their cost of ownership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will say, though, it's not all positive. I, let's. How do I frame this? Right. So, mm -hmm. just put building a bin isn't going to make you money. It, you are going to have to be a better manager right. at yeah. that point, right? Because these high interest rates could potentially catch up to you yes. if you're not managing, if you're not taking advantage of that bin. It's not store and ignore? No. Well, <laughs> think about it now. If you have an operating line at a million dollars at 7 8% interest, that is going to eat away. So sometimes maybe you would have been better to sell off. If you're not going to take advantage of the bin and, and make more money with it, mm -hmm. maybe you would have been better off selling right away and paying down. And you still can because another thing that Bree hit right away in the beginning is the efficiency that you gain at harvest time. Yes. Right. So maybe the grain only hangs out in the bin for 30 days. Mm -hmm. But there's a substantial factor during harvest. How do you help your customers calculate what type of a benefit that provides? Yeah. So when guys are, are looking at, you know, how much time is saved by storing their own grain, I always look at how many miles do you live on average from fields that you're farming, right? How yep. far away are you from the local co-op? Now, in our area, we're very rural, so you could drive 20 miles to the nearest co-op. Um, so you've got that time, you've got that fuel cost, right? And obviously this last year, diesel was really expensive. And so um, so we're looking at those two things. And then your, your cost that you're paying that driver to drive that far, the additional time that they're spending in the truck, and then of course the wait time in the, in the elevator line. And so I, I never try to put a number on it for somebody, um, you know, a, a, a hard and fast number. I generally ask them, what do you think it's costing you? Yeah. And then we can kind of work backwards into that um, because every operation is different and, and everybody is, is paying a different amount to their drivers. And so, um, so using that number, then we can kind of say, okay, if you're only driving three miles from your field to the farm, now we're saving, you know, 24, 25 miles, right. 26 miles, depending on where they, where they were um, in, in cost and fuel and yep. time for your driver. And so, um, so it does make, it does make a big difference. Um, and, and you still have, you know, you're still going to run into things where, um, if you have mechanical failure or something like that, that, that can throw a kind of a hitch in your giddy yeah. up at that time. But, um, but those things and Sukup's really great about this, having, um, guys on call that can come out and, and fix those problems they for are. you. So, um, that, that level of service is excellent. I have the perfect example that we actually used on our farm this year of efficiency, at harvest, just because you put it in the bin doesn't mean you have to wait until next summer to sell it. Right. We put it in the bin. We typically wrap up harvest mid to early November, mm -hmm. and then we like to get our tillage or whatever fertilizer on and all that kind of stuff. So we were able to wrap up first week in November, filled all the bins. We had to take a little bit of town. Good problem to have, mm -hmm. but we sure. need more bins. Um, I can help you with that. Normally, yeah, normally mm -hmm. we would, like, take out the peaks in the bins in late December, early January. Mm -hmm. The basis 
happened to be like everyone got done with harvest and no one like they shut their do their doors right right so this is the prime example of local demand yeah. basis went from like 25 over to 45 over yeah we emptied a whole bin and peaked others in november we've never hauled that much grain before right and it was the best price we've sold <laughs> you know? yeah yeah even now you couldn't get that price yeah, it makes a it makes a huge difference. So it gives you the to, flexibility, yeah. to take advantage. Yep. And we've I've Absolutely. got the counter story. Yep. Our my in laws ha fall harvest this year took longer than normal. Oh yeah. Mm. Because we're still waiting on getting bins rebuilt from after the drain show. Oh. So we sat in line at every ethanol plant. Every load went there. We were putting corn on the ground at the feed yard. Mm -hmm as grain storage to scoot back up and haul away, kind of like Corey. They, they were begging me to come run trucks for them. It's like, <laughs> we're doing our own stuff, right? right we're done yeah. with harvest, but that doesn't mean we're done with the work. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Just, just the flexibility of being able to run two more hours a day because the elevator shut down mm -hmm. and you wanted to run until 7 p.m., let alone 10, 11, or 12 at night. Right. Or a second shift because you have that flexibility. And then they started shutting down early, Yeah. Day, certain days, and then all the, other, the lines were terrible. Yeah. yeah. We got to the point to where this fall we would load everything and the combine operator could quit and go work on tillage mm -hmm. until the trucks got back from the ethanol plant. So it just right. it was an unfortunate circumstance for us, sure. but it really demonstrated how valuable having the bins on the farm were. I would argue that this fall you could, probably could have paid for multiple bins just in the inefficiencies mm -hmm. on the other side of things. We can get way more in depth as to matching grain cart size and truck fleet to right. combines, but we're not going to go there today. Mm -hmm. But that, that's certainly uh, a part of that. So we talked about the hours, the availability. Uh, we know that downtime is an issue, whether weather or not. Uh, also, the type of equipment and manufacturer breakdowns that you have, the service that you can get, mm -hmm. the ability to haul to your own storage bins within a close proximity, cutting mm -hmm. your drive down like you talked about. So a yeah. lot of things there help make us a lot more efficient and can be a factor into pain or justifying mm -hmm. putting up a bin setup. On top of with the bins is the grain handling side of things. And we have been wrestling with that because how do you value your time and efficiency? How do you go from that eight row to that 12 row without having to put up a brand new wet bin, without having to buy another grain cart, buy another semi with speed and efficiency dumping, right? right. You can keep up with two trucks with a 12 row if you can sit there, dump, open both your hoppers and then leave. Mm -hmm. And Sukup can handle, help you with that and you can finance it. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. So then, Bree, is the question more, how do I afford to build the setup, or is it how can I not afford? <laughs> I would say uh, right now it's how can I not afford um, to put it up. Um, we've got multiple options as far as, um, you know, making a payment work for somebody. Um, we can go anywhere from three years to 12 years on a grain bin setup. Um, and, and on a true tax lease, they're, they're making back that entire payment on their taxes. They're writing off the full principal and interest. And so, um, so when you're, when you're weighing those options versus, and then, and then of course you're the plus side of, of marketability for that grain, it's really kind of a no brainer. I mean, we can really drill down numbers and, and come up with a number that says, and, and I always err on the side of caution on these numbers. I have one guy that I said, I figured he would pay his his bins would pay for themselves in year three, um, being again, very cautious with basis numbers and, um, protein premium and those kinds of things. And then, um, he called me after year one and said, actually, if I had filled both bins with beans, I would have paid for it in year one. Like yeah. my, my project would have been paid for. And so, um, and so, and now he's expanding. I mean, we're adding right. a scale and he's talking about adding another bin and, you know, there's, there's, you never, you don't have to go big at first. Um, you know, so there's some guys that ease into it and, and that makes more sense for them. But, um, but we offer multiple solutions to fit their need and make them comfortable with that, um, with that investment on their farm. But um, it's kind of one of those you got to spend money to make money things. And, yeah. and, and this situation is exactly that. So. so I assume you give the advice to all of your clients that they should track the ROI after Absolutely. the fact. We're, Absolutely. We're, you're going to help put a projection together. But right. why is it important to actually figure how it's getting paid Most for? of the time because I was wrong. 
So, <laughs> <laughs> and I like to be, I like to be wrong on the side of, I said it was going to take you longer than it did, yeah. um, which is part of the reason that I, that I try to be very cautious about it. But, um, but I think it's highly important because now they can see, okay, if, if my return on investment, if I made it back in two years and I was still taking grain to the co-op and maybe in a large quantity, um, then we can start looking at, does it make sense to add another, bo- another bin or two bins or whatever? Um, or does it make sense to expand and add, um, you know, a leg and a tower and a right. dryer? And, you know, once we can really track that profitability on their side as to true numbers as you know, from what they were selling, yeah. then we can go back and, and make more sense of expanding or, or making additional, add, you know, add-ons to the, right. to the current setup. It's going to be different for every farm, Corey. Oh, right? Trying Very to figure much. the ROI yeah. out. Oh, it's, yeah, you can't even get into it, right? <laughs> some people have ground paid off. Some people are all rented. Some people are a custom farm. You know, it's, it's. Right. Well, you even mentioned it, the difference of running an 8-row versus a 12-row head. Yeah. Or a 6 versus a 12. Yeah. Or whatever it or ends up being. Or 16 or two combines. You know, yeah. how, you know mm-hmm. how do you figure all that? It's every one is different. Yeah. Yep. So you got to know your numbers. You do. You really have to know your numbers. And and when you try to look at that, Bree, it, it, it's going to be way more complicated. And that's why they need a trusted advisor, mm-hmm. whether it's you, whether it's me. Right. Because there's a lot of things that once you solve one piece of the puzzle, it may be that you went from one grain cart to two because you had the ability to keep it away because your trucks could dump faster and sure. now your combine never stops. Or this first year you went from we had two carts, one combine, and we could actually keep it away. We got a second machine. You know, there's a lot of things that right. solving one piece of the puzzle allows you to analyze the rest mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. And it, I always tell my guys it paints a picture for um, what the future looks like for you, right? So it's always hard to say what the market's going to do, but if you can have a little bit more control over what the market's going to do for you, um, then you can kind of, you know, control your own paycheck at the end of the day. And, um, and that's, that's very palatable yeah. for guys. So, so why, why Suka? You're in the business of selling money, yeah, right? And you could hitch with, there's, I don't know, 10 different grain mm-hmm. bin companies, probably more, sure. and, and more when you talk about grain handling. Why would you hit your wagon with Sukup? Yeah, so um, so the the partnership with Sukup came about because I had I had multiple farmers that I put up bins for, um, lots of different um, companies that we put those up with, um, and I, I found over a few years that the Sukup bins I never had a customer come back and say, hey, I need X Y Z or this didn't this didn't work the way I thought it was going to, and we get those calls. I'm sure you do as a lender too. They they feel like they they can confide in you and that something is not working. And yeah. so, um, so we generally get that first phone call. Um, and, and Sukup just always seemed to kind of rise to the top of that. Cream um, rise to the top. Yes, exactly. Right? Exactly. The, the product they were providing was, was so good that I was not getting a lot of return. I wasn't getting any return calls um, of customers being upset about something. And that's not to say any other line was, you know, higher than the other or something like that as far as, as um, complaints go. But um but it really kind of zeroed me in on the fact that Sukup was doing a really great job as, of, of providing the, the product to the customer. And then on top of that, um, the fact that they're family owned and operated, I, I love that. Um, our, our company, we're actually a, a sister company to CGB Grain, which is obviously a large um, uh, grain company. But uh, we kind of operate on the AgFi side as a family owned and operated um, business. Our, our president that, that still sits in our office today is who started the company um, years and years ago, like 1984, if I remember correctly. Um, and so we really operate in that space. And so it made sense for us there to, to partner with them. Um, and it just so happened that I, that I bugged Tom long enough about having coffee with me to talk about what, how they were currently financing their bins that um, he, he accepted a, a coffee date with me in Ames, Iowa, and, and our, our relationship was born from there. You so. missed out there, Tanner. I did. <laughs> <laughs> you just yeah. got to bug people. <laughs> I had, had the, wrong, the wrong request. My, co- my coffee turned into podcast interviews at trade shows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, this has been great. It's, I know this is going to provide value to our listeners because sure. there's a lot of people that see shiny bins as they drive down the road, and they wonder how can they afford these. Mm-hmm. And the question, like we said, might not be how could you afford to not. Right. Now, I can that, figure out how to make it affordable for you. Sure. So. And, and it doesn't mean that we have to go to a six bin setup with a 4,000 bushel an hour leg or yeah. whatever right. it is. Right. You know, that's actually probably not that fast for an unload capacity. <laughs> but just the sheer fact of 
you customize it to your own farm. Right. And that's how we're going to look at this on mm -hmm. an ROI basis yep. is what's your initial investment? What's maybe a plan for a couple of years down the road? You know, yeah, obviously, sure. Corey, your family is going to take that into consideration as you make your plan. Yeah. What's the expansion opportunity? Where's the risk at, at, at potentially not having yeah. expansion? So Right. And it, it gets so hard on the farm because it, it feels like there's so many places our capital mm -hmm. could go. Like it yeah. feels like, oh, definitely. you know, so having the numbers and a partner to help, you know, walk through the mud mm -hmm. um, and make it clear, it helps out a lot. Because when you know the numbers and it makes sense, it's easy to make the decision. Right, right. Indecision <laughs> is hard when you don't know. Yes, yeah. And it's all emotion. And we really try, I think, and you do the same, I'm sure, we kind of act as a neutral party, right? We're, we're not selling the bin yeah. um, and we're not selling your grain kind of in a neutral territory and we're really just here to show you mm -hmm. what makes sense right. um, with the numbers that you're currently producing and APH reports and ha those kinds of things. So, Have you got into much with like the beginning farmer program through FSA or yeah. equip or reap yeah. grants type stuff? Yeah. So we use the reap grant quite a bit with um, souk up on the drier side of things. So that's um, something that is fairly new to us as we just recently partnered with souk up this last fall. Um, but yeah, the, the REAP grant is a great way to get, I mean, gosh, I think they're getting about half back on the, the cost of that. I think it's about 40%. I'm actually yeah. going through it myself Very good. right now. And, but that's up from 25%. Right, which is huge. That's a, they're th and a large went number. From, and don't quote me on this, from $50 million to $800 million, yes. $700 million, Yeah, they just keep like that. increasing that, that pot just of money. because it's efficiency right. driven. Yes. And, and that's, you know, the government is, is really pushing that um, from all sides, whether it's yep. biofuel or right. um, or what it may be. But um, but yeah, that's that's a huge plus. Um, we use the the REAP grant side of things. Sukup's done a fabulous job of partnering their customers with those grant writers yep. to make that grant possible for them. And then on the FSA side, yeah, we use first time farmer rancher a lot. We use the 50 yep. 50. Um, so, uh, you know, our job in that space is really to partner with FSA to make those uh, loans work for yeah. that customer and, and really to help the customer through the paperwork process. Those FSA offices are busy. And I I'm, mean, they are just... I'm going to tell you right now, having a partner to go into that fight with you yes. <laughs> is absolutely crucial. Right. And that'll make or break. Yes. But yeah. I also heard that they streamlined the process now. They have. They have, yes. that The process has gotten much easier as far as paperwork and things like that go. It's had to. They, but they were getting so far behind. Yes. They needed to just for the, fierce, the, the sheer sake of implosion. Sure. I wanted to call... I, I did call, and I, like, screamed at yeah. you several times. Yeah. <laughs> like, that had nothing to do with I, it. You know, well, no, it's not the person in the FSA's office right. problem. Like, there's one, two pr people in that office and, like, 30 yeah. desks that are empty. Sure. And a stack when you go in there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, they need to revamp this yeah. or, or give it to the private industry mm -hmm. and let them handle it. Yeah. So hopefully something that or yeah. just works. Right? Yeah, there may be some changes on the horizon for yeah. that. But um, but for now, we, we utilize it. And anytime I get a, a customer that calls that fits in that box of first-time farmer rancher, that is something that I always yeah. um, suggest to them. I mean, you just, you can't beat that program. 100% well, financing. I mean, there's so many pluses. The rate is a little bit lower. We get a blended rate environment in that space. And so it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the interest is way cheaper, way worth mm -hmm. it. Um, and then it's really nice for you guys, right? They let you guys have the, the better position on the loan. We do, yeah. We get, <laughs> yeah, we get a <laughs> first, yeah. first position there. So, yeah, that does help. And, yep. and, and they've been a great partner for us. So, um, so we enjoy working with them. That is what we've noticed with Sukup is they do a very good job of selecting partners. They it do, seems yes. across the board. I mean, obviously, they're yeah, celebrating the 60 years. Right. That, I did. I mean, they're doing something right. <laughs> they select great partners to wear even content for our listeners-wise. Mm -hmm. I mean, Clover Dance was huge. We yeah, had yeah. such a fantastic response to him based sure. on you know, his understanding of the grant programs, the opportunity to, mm -hmm. to offset some of the costs, the fact that you guys are working with them to create affordable solutions mm -hmm. to build grain storage and grain handling. Right. You know, they partner with us, one of the leading ag podcasts in the nation. They just yeah. suck up selects quality people, which is really leads to why their product itself is of quality. Right. It's yeah. across the board. And Steve will say that too. That's yes. one of the first standards that they want to maintain. So. Yeah, yeah, and that's a testament to the people that, that run the company. And yep. that's a that's a testament to Steve and, and his support staff and Tom and all the guys that um, that work day in and day out. And also their dealers. I think they do a really great job of selecting dealers to represent their product. Yep. Um, that that are just really top notch in the market. I so. think it says a lot about the company. Yeah. Absolutely. 
So I'm going to get ready to summarize what we're talking about today. Sure. Every one of our guests gets asked the same question, and that what what does success look like to you? It doesn't have to be in finance. It can be in life, in general, yeah. your most successful clients. So be thinking about that, and I'll try to hit some of the items we got today. So again, hanging out at National Farm Machinery Show. We talked about the advantages and profitability of storing grain at home, on-farm grain storage. A direct effect to your bottom line in multiple ways. It allows you to pay, potentially run your operation more efficiently, run it on your terms, run it at your hours, be able to avoid losing control. It ultimately gains control on a lot of different fronts. Time, flexibility, quality, the, de the decision to make a marketing play, uh, to take advantage of the market. We can help control our basis just by trying to hit seasonal times in which it's usually more favorable to us or taking advantage like Corey did of an unseasonable opportunity just because of the local market demand. It allows us to maintain the quality of our crop, whether that's saving us money and drying it down or potentially allowing us to blend up moisture levels in soybeans. Other crops, obviously, we can continue to handle, making sure that we don't have any damage issues and deliver the best quality of product that we have. We have the flexibility to market, like we talked about, giving us more options than just the local co-op. We can take it further because it, it fits our time and availability. The efficiency we hit on, and uh, if you need a personal testimonial about that, give me a call because I know what it's like when you don't have access to it. When you're used to having access to bins, and you can't get it, uh, it's a very drastic change yeah. in your operation when Definitely. one cog is now missing from your wheel. We talked about the ROI. We mm -hmm. look at it across it every single farm, and it's going to be different, but even three to five years is a good blanket term mm -hmm. as to how and when it typically pays back to the farmer. But right. Bree has options from three to 12 years Correct. Uh -huh. to, to try and make a site affordable for you and fit into the cash flow of your operation. There are other government loan programs and, mm -hmm. and grant opportunities to help subsidize the cost or make it more affordable that we have access to. And investing in a quality product will go a long way because you don't want to have to deal with maintenance issues mm -hmm. right away. It's going to happen. There's going to be breakdowns. Sure. There's going to be pieces that need replaced. Uh, but if you start with quality, you hopefully get a little bit more longevity. And the last piece I want to add that we didn't necessarily talk on, but it's all summarized, is it presents opportunity. You don't have the opportunity to do any of that if you don't have the storage. Yep. I, I also wanted to add that we didn't touch on is it gives you the ability to hedge risk. Yeah. Right? right. You having physical grain in the bin, you could actually you look at your get, get it with a good partner on marketing. You got puts, calls, all that, and you have the physical to back it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it gives you more options there. Yeah. So what does success look like to Bree? Gosh, I would, I would, I always say that I am not successful if my producers are not successful. So um, if if my producers are in a place where they're making money and they're happy, then that's my success. So I'm really here to serve the farm. Um, I, I want to make sure that, that my farmers are as profitable as they can be, which is really why I, I spend a lot of my um, time and energy in the grain storage space. Um, but that's, that's what's most important to me. If my producers are successful, I'm, I consider myself su successful as well. I, I just be careful if we have another 80s again. Don't just, it's not your fault. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be hiding under my desk. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. That was really good. Corey, do you got a challenge for the listeners? Yeah, I'd say it's, the, what we talked about with Suka partnering with people, like for your farm, find the right people to partner with. Maybe Absolutely. it's Suka, maybe it's someone else, maybe mm -hmm. it's AgriFinance, maybe it's someone else, you know, but mm -hmm. have the right people on your team, right? Absolutely. Because that's going to help make the decisions. It's going to help rise the tide, raise all boats. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Absolutely. Bree, if people want to look at your options yeah. or reach out to you, what's the best sure. way for them to connect with you? Yeah, so uh, our website is uh, cgb-agfi.com. Whoa. Um, so cgb-agfi.com. Cgb cgb yeah, so um, the CGB part comes from the Consolidated Grain and Barge yeah. portion of our of our business, and then AgFi is short for AgriFinancial, so cgb-agfi.com. Um, so they can reach out to me uh, there, uh, all of my contact information, and all of, we actually have RSOs all over the United States, so if you happen to be on the East Coast or the West Coast, we've got people in both um, both sides of the country there and, and people all, all in between. Um, I just happen to be centered almost right in the middle. Um, so definitely have somebody out there that could reach out to you if you needed. Um, and then uh, we can also be reached on Instagram. Um, we have CGB AgFi Instagram page on Facebook. Um, 
pretty much anywhere you're spending your time, you can Absolutely. find us. And we'll continue to tag you guys when this episode comes out. Sure. And also, listeners, if you can't find them, farmforprofitllc at gmail.com, and we can get you connected to Bree. Bree, it was a pleasure. Thank you. It was Thanks great to meet you me. all week and yeah. get uh, some information into our listeners' ears. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You bet. Listeners, thanks again for listening. And until next time, have a good one.